tried to get her last time for the functional conf. She couldn't make it, but I'm glad she's here. And I'll let her introduce herself. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. <coughs> okay. Right. Yeah. <coughs> okay, good. It's uh, 9 a.m. in the morning. And I'm apparently giving the opening keynote for this conference. I'm not a morning person. I can only assume that this means that Naresh is trying to kill me. But I'll try and center on. Um, see that image. <laughs> right. Um, so what I'm going to do today to get you sort of warmed up for the entire three days of the conference is I'm going to do some live coding for you. I'm going to actually just write a game. And I'm going to show you some, some interesting techniques for doing that. But before I start that, let me just talk about the state of JavaScript currently. Because I'm just going to come right out and, and say it. I'm a hipster. That means, by my definition, that I like to feel special and, and smarter and, and more superior to, to other programmers. Which means that, obviously, I go into functional programming, because functional programming is a splendid tool for making other people feel stupid. But the state of JavaScript today, though, is sort of not doing it for me. We've got these giant frameworks everywhere. I mean, jQuery is good, OK. It's tiny, but you've got like uh, Angular and, and Ember and, and other giant things. Like, Angular actually has dependency injection. Do you know what that makes me think? It's like, it's enterprise programming, isn't it? And that's not really what I sign up for. It doesn't make me feel like I'm doing anything special. Because in functional programming, you have things like, you have this vocabulary from mathematics, which is just amazing for confusing people. Like, you've got the closely arrows, you've got the, the you need a lemma. I'm not sure what a you need a lemma is, but it, apparently you need one. Um, and so I go into morphic prepromorphisms. That's a real thing in Haskell. And, and there's nothing like a word like, actually, I had to practice a lot to, to learn how to say saga is a prepromorphisms. <coughs> and there's nothing like it to make other programmers feel like, what's going on? I, I have no idea what's happening here. Um, the sad thing, though, is that none of these actually translate very well to JavaScript. None of these things, which are fantastically useful in Haskell, are actually useful in JavaScript which makes the proposition of doing functional programming in JavaScript a bit harder than I'd like to. <coughs> Fortunately, there's this thing called functional reactive programming now. Um, or I should say, there's this thing called functional reactive programming, and then there are lots of libraries trying to implement that, and apparently not succeeding, because it's like a trademark term or something. But we got a lot of, of libraries implementing the general principles. Um, this turns out to be not just useful, but actually very powerful in, in developing clean applications using JavaScript. It's not just the idea of doing functional programming so, so you can point at others and, and feel, feel smug about them not understanding what you're doing. But it actually turns out this is a great way to structure your applications. I'm going to show you the basic principles of it in a bit. I'm just going to walk through the sort of technologies I'm going to be using today. There's this thing called reactive extensions, which is not quite an implementation of functional reactive programming, but it's, it's the one that's sort of taken off. It started in C-sharp. It was invented by this fellow, uh, Eric Meyer, and at Microsoft, and it sort of spread out towards other platforms. You got one for Python, you got one for Java now, and of course you got RxJS for JavaScript written by another fellow at Microsoft called Matt Podwysocki, and I seem to have gotten my images confused, because that's pretty sure that's not him. Don't know who that guy is. Uh, so we're going to be using RxJS to write our games. I'm also going to be using ReactJS, because that's the new hot thing right now for doing sort of functional programming. Um, that's a UI framework. I'm not going to be using the whole thing. I'm just going to be using the bit that's uh, rendering 
to the DOM, to the screen. And that's it, really. I'm going to show you the principles of functional reactive programming here. So essentially, at the core of it is the idea of, of essentially a stream of data, which in our act is called an observable. And this is asynchronous. Although, as you can see here, you can create them from arrays, the, the simplest way of creating one. So that's not really asynchronous. That's just going to feed us all the elements of the array. And I put six ponies in for you, because who doesn't like ponies? And the idea is that to get things out of this stream, this observable, you can subscribe to it. And the subscribe method takes a function, and it takes the a variable p for pony, and you can do things like console.log p, and all the ponies are going to come out. I made a cheat function for you, which looks a bit prettier. It's just called log. So when I run this, I, I would expect all the ponies to come out of the stream. And indeed, they do. You can't see all of them on screen at, at, at the same time. But we got four of them at least, four and a half. And the interesting thing about this is you can treat it sort of like a JavaScript array. Like you can filter on it. You can map over it. You can do a lot of things. But I'm going to show you the basics. I'm going to map a function because I want to express my appreciation for ponies. So I'm just going to go straight out and say that I love p. And map that function over, over the observable. And that's going to have about the same effect as if you were, were to map over an array. So you can see we now lo love these ponies. But this isn't quite right, though, because some of these ponies are rather boring. So how about we filter out some of them? Like Applejack, who likes Applejack? Uh, so let's just keep the ponies whose names end with an E. That's close enough, I think. So let's apply a regular expression match um, on the P. Now we only love Twilight Sparkle and Pinkie Pie. That's close enough. Of course, Pinkie Pie is best pony, but Twilight can get to be there as well. So that's a basic idea, but it's get, it gets more interesting because we, as I mentioned, these are asynchronous, and we can actually extend them over time. Like I've created a stream for you right here, which takes the observable interval constructor which just takes a number of milliseconds. And what that will do is it will create a stream, which every 500 milliseconds in this case, it's going to produce a number incrementing. It's going to start at zero and then tick up one, two, three, and so on. And I'm zipping that with our pony stream, which means that the stream that I'm creating using, using the zip constructor We'll wait until both of the streams that I'm passing in have yielded the interval and the ponies, and then yield, and then call this function to figure out what it's going to output. And that's just going to, I'm picking, it gets two arguments, the values from the two streams. So the i in this case is going to be the pony, so I just re return the pony. And that should give us a stream which yields uh, one pony every 500 milliseconds. About two pennies a second, that's pretty good. Yeah. And of course, we can still do, we can still map and filter. Like, see, now it's mapping uh, asynchronously. And this one's interesting. If we now filter on ponies ending with E, I'm starting it now. It takes about, there's twilight, then about two seconds, then pinky. And then we're complete. So you can see that uh, all, of, all of the ponies are coming from the underlying stream, but we're, we're filtering out some of them. They're still coming at, at a rate of, of two per second, but this stream isn't actually yielding every um, 500 milliseconds. It's yielding whenever there is a pony that we actually care about. So that was the basics. What can we do with this? Actually, we can build a complete game. I realize I haven't got my notes out. Just a second. Okay, hopefully 
think this is safe. So let's show you what I got here. I, I wrote some functions already, which are just too boring to write on stage. First of all, um, what you're seeing on the right is actually an HTML document. And there is an element inside it called the canvas, which is just a div, and it's got a background image, which is the, uh, the sky over Equestria at this, at this moment. I've got this function here because one of the principles of functional programming is that we strive towards purity, which means that um, a function should not have side effects if you can avoid it. And we're going to try and stick to that. And more importantly, uh, values, data structures, should not change at all. At least once you, you've returned them from a function, they're not allowed to change. So I've got this function here, which helps us cope with that. It essentially, it takes an object, it takes an optional uh, other object, it merges the two, and it makes a copy of it. So I'm going to use this to, to update my data structures, making copies, so that we won't have to change them uh, to update the game state. I've got this function on screen, which is just to determine whether uh, things are inside that that frame, essentially. And I got this bind key function, which simply takes the name of a key and will return um, an observable stream, which will contain the name of the key whenever the key is actually pressed. So I'm gonna use that for input, okay. Now, first of all, we are going to have to get us a rendering function. Um, I'm going to try and render the ground first. Well. So I think I should probably explain the game that I'm trying to make. You played Robot Unicorn Attack. It's essentially, it's a side-scrolling game with a robot unicorn running across uh, the ground, uh, leaping over obstacles, and, and catching the stuff of dreams. So I'm going to, I, I don't really like robots and unicorns, I like ponies, so I'm gonna try and, and do something similar except with a pony. Um, I'm going to have some ground just moving along. I'm going to have a pony running along, along the ground. Then I'm going to have things that she can jump and catch. And I'm going to have things that she has to avoid or the game will end. So first, let's start with the ground. Oh, that's, uh, that's just a library I'm using for the, that's what gets me the, the keys. So essentially, if I call bind key space, I'll get an observable stream, uh, which occasionally yields uh, the word space. And, and the reason I can just go space instead of whatever key code that is, is mousetrap. It's just to help me along. Okay, so I'm going to represent objects in the game by a simple data structure. Uh, I'm going to have a variable called ground in which I will store the properties of the ground. First of all, it needs an ID, which is going to be ground. That's going to map to a CSS class, essentially. So I got some CSS already installed there, as you can see, which gets me um, essentially the images for the objects. So ground is just gonna be a ground texture and it will need an X coordinate. Um, I'm going to put that at 384. I'm also going to introduce the idea of um, a base coordinate, and I want this to be optional. So what I'm doing here, essentially, is that I'm saying that the, the axis for this object is offset by 128 off in that direction uh, for the ground. Essentially what this means is, is when I render it, I take base x plus x, and that's where the object is gonna be. This is gonna be useful later because, well for one thing, I'm using this as an offset because the texture for the ground actually has, has an end point. And I don't want to render that, I just want to have the ground sort of scroll by seamlessly so you can't tell that that is actually just really leaping back. 
just going to try and render this, and I'm going to show you how to do it later. Uh, I need a rendering function. It's called make element. It will take one of these nodes, and it will return a React dub node. It's going to be a div, and it's going to have a class name of node.id. I believe it also needs a key of node.id to keep React happy. And I'm going to add some CSS to position it. Left is going to be node.x plus either node.base x if it exists, otherwise zero. And then pixels. Do you see a problem here? Well, the thing is, I'm not guaranteed, because this is JavaScript, so we don't have integers, really. I'm not guaranteed that this is going to be an integer, and I believe that the, the pixels um, CSS style actually requires that. So I'm going to do um, a trick. This is like hardcore JavaScript optimization. Um, how, would you, how would you round off a JavaScript number to get an integer? Master round, yeah? Master floor, I'd say, to make sure it's just uh, clipped. Yeah, it turns out master.floor or master round are actually not very efficient. So this is the thing that they did in ASM.js to make it really efficient. Because you have a, a bitwise or in JavaScript, and, and the bitwise operations only work on integers. So if you just or any number with zero, that's apparently a really efficient way of getting an integer out of a JavaScript number. So now you know how to make your JavaScript really fast. Plus node.base y, just doing the same thing here. Magic trick zero plus px. Okay. So this gets us a div which I then have to pass on to React for rendering. The idea of React here is that you create sort of a, a data structure called a virtual DOM, which represents what you want to, to actually put into the DOM. And then we have to tell React to please actually put that into the actual DOM. So I'll have a function render scene, which takes a list of these nodes. And Puts them on the screen. Render component. Actually, it's not render component, is it? Render nowadays. Um, and a React DOM div, which has no properties. This is just to contain our elements. And nodes.map make element. So what I did there is I took my list of nodes, mapped it over make element, which turns every node in the list into a div. Then I passed this list of divs onto React.render. And I also need to tell it where to put it, and that's going to be my canvas, which I got earlier. So let's see if that still compiles. It does. So let's just try and put that on, on the screen. Render scene ground. Well, wow. list of ground. Ah, there's the ground. Now we need to make it move. So this is where reactive extensions comes in. So this is just a, a, static, a static data structure now. But I need to turn this const ground into const ground stream, which is essentially going to create a stream of these nodes with the coordinates updating uh, at regular intervals. So the, uh, the ground will actually start moving. So the way to do that is to create an Rx observable interval with a decent frame rate. Let's go for 33 milliseconds. That is, I think, uh, about 30 frames per second. Um, 
and then we map a function over that, a function which takes x, which is going to be the incrementing number, and then returns this data structure. Okay. Balance parentheses, okay. So, at this point, I want to take this x and I want to turn it into an appropriate x coordinate for the ground. So I have arrived at this formula through science, which means blind experimentation. x modulo 64 multiplied by negative 8. So what this does essentially is, because we've got a, a number that starts at 0 and increments by 1 every 33 milliseconds, and uh, when it hits 64, I want it to wrap around and start at zero again, so I get from zero to 63 endlessly. And that's what the modulo does. And I take that number and I multiply it by negative eight, which means that it's gonna start off at zero, then it's gonna be negative eight, then negative 16, and so on, until it reaches negative whatever eight times 63 is. Then it wraps around, which will cause this texture to sort of move um, gently towards the left, then just before we reach the end of the texture, we loop it back to where it started, so it sort of looks like a seamless, endless texture. So this ground stream should do that now. Yes, which map function? Up here. Uh, from the interval stream. As I mentioned, this is going to be a number every 33 milliseconds, which counts upwards. So zero, one, two, three, every 33 milliseconds. And I'm just taking advantage of, of the fact that this is an incrementing number to, to make the animation. So let's try and, and render this. Uh, I should be able to just subscribe to that stream. Uh, oh, sorry. That's a uh, ground stream, subscribe, render scene. Does that look good? Trick question, obviously. Render scene takes a list of nodes. What comes out of the ground stream? Just one node. So I'm going to do some trickery here. I'm not gonna subscribe to the ground stream. I'm going to subscribe to Structure called zip array, which is sort of like the zip that I showed you earlier, except that instead of doing that function, letting me select which of the arrays, uh, which of the streams I'm interested in, it just gives us back an array of, of the elements of, of each stream, which is exactly what we want here, isn't it? So we we'll just zip the ground stream. That's going to essentially turn the ground stream into from, from um, a stream of nodes to a stream of lists of just that current node. And that we can subscribe to render scene. So if this works, fingers crossed, the ground is going to start scrolling. And it does. Cool. So we've got moving ground. We're nearly there. Now let's put some ponies on, shall we? I think it's probably time for that. Let's just move the ground stream up down a bit. I like to keep this organized. I want the rendering functions on top and then I want the streams beneath here. <coughs> and the subscription right at the end. So, I'm going to make, I should ask you by the way, do you have a preference for ponies in this case? No? Let's go for Pinkie Pie then. Pinkie Stream. Because actually Pinkie Pie is the only pony I've prepared, so don't really have a choice. Um, first, actually, I wanna make a tick. Because I'm gonna reuse that one a bit. Just the same as earlier. Um, incrementing number, interval 33 milliseconds. And I take that tick, and in this case, I'm going to scan over it. 
the scan is sort of like uh, reduced on JavaScript arrays, except that instead of, of running through the entire array and then producing uh, a result at the end, it lets me produce intermediate results based on the previous value of, of the stream. So the first thing it takes is the initial value of the stream. That's gonna be one of our nodes, and it's gonna be called Pinky. It's going to have a base Y of 276. That puts Pinky right on the ground when she's at Y0. And she starts at X0 and Y0. And that should do it, shouldn't it? So we need a function. And the scan takes, first it takes the previous value of the stream, of the, the scan, which is gonna start out being just this node that I put here. And it takes the input, which is going to be, well, it's going to be nothing we care about right now. Let's just call it x. So inside this function, I need to implement the game logic for Pinky. So I'm actually going to, let's just see if we can get her on screen first. So that's really simple, we just return p. And I need to add Pinky to the zip array. Pinky stream. And does this look right? Yes it does, let's see if Pinky appears. There she is, excellent. We're getting somewhere. Now let's make her jump. That means we're going to need a physics engine. Um, oh, I've got 34 minutes left, that shall be more than enough time. So I'm going to have a function called velocity, which takes a node, essentially, and let's call it node, let's make it readable. And I'm going to introduce uh, some more values to the node data structure. I'm going to have a velocity, a vx and a vy for the velocity in each, on each axis. And what this is gonna do essentially is, let's say I make the vx one, that would move pinky one pixel forward each tick. And the velocity function should apply this. I'm using the asos function that I showed you on top there my magical data structure function, which first of all makes a copy of the node, and it also takes another object which is going to be merged with the copy of the node. So I can use this to update the x and y coordinates. It's current x plus, it's current vx is gonna be its new x, likewise for y. There we go. And now let's apply this to Pinky. So we start off just by going P equals velocity of P. So that applies whatever velocity she has. And of course right now she has nothing. So let's add gravity. Let's apply gravity to Pinky's position. Uh, so essentially every tick we increase her downwards velocity by the value of gravity. And what is gravity at the Earth's surface? Yes, indeed, 9.8 Newtons. So rounding that off to pixels, I'm making it 0.98. That's Newton to pixels. I think that's like mostly scientifically legit. All right, so now gravity's working on me, yeah. Um, that's the slight problem. She falls through the ground. That's not supposed to happen. Um, actually, let's do some BDD here. Going to outline the use case as Pinkie Pie, given that I'm falling when I hit the ground, then I stop. We need to implement this. And that's fairly straightforward, actually. Uh, we know that if, if her y coordinate is zero, that means she's on the ground. So we just have to make sure that it never goes below zero because that would make her actually fall through a solid object and that's not supposed to happen. So essentially, if her 
p dot y is greater than or equal to zero. That means she's on the ground or below it. And she's moving downwards. Then we put her right on the ground at zero and we make her stop. So now she should stay, but gravity is still applying, just she can't fall through the ground. Which is going to matter because now I'm gonna make a jump. And to do that, I'm not gonna be using tick here. I'm going to be using, actually I'm gonna modify tick a bit. Instead of just this interval, I'm going to make it, I'm going to make use of the bind key function for the space bar, which is going to be the key that I hit when I wanted to jump, and I buffer that over the interval tick. So what this will do, um, the bind key, as I mentioned, is going to produce the word space every time I press the space bar. And what buffer does is that it collects each value coming out of the input stream, the bind key, every time this one yields a value. It doesn't care about the value yielded, just that when it happens, that's when we cut off the buffer. So what this will do is it's going to give us a list of all the spaces that were pressed inside of 33 milliseconds, which is usually either nothing or one, or if I'm really, really quick, it could be more than one. But the idea here is if I've pressed space at least once in 33 milliseconds, that, that should be enough to make Pinky jump. So right now, I'm just gonna see that it's still working. Yes, it is. Except now this X is not the incrementing, in, the incrementing number, it's an empty list. And I'm gonna rename that to keys. And so, When I hit the space bar, essentially if the first value of keys is space, then I make her move upwards at a decent speed, 20 pixels per second, per tick, sorry. And let's play some sound, sound works. You've probably heard this sound before. Not very original when it comes to sound effects. So this is the idea. Uh, I set her moving at an upwards velocity. Gravity is going to eventually move that into a positive value, which means she's going to start falling. And then once she hits the ground, she's going to stop. Let's see. Yes. Excellent. Very good. Oh. Something going on here. What's the problem? Oh, there she is. Um, she can still keep jumping, even if she's not on the ground. She actually has to be on the ground to be, to be allowed to jump, yeah? So we are going to have to change this a bit. We're going to have to check if PY is zero. If she is on the ground, then she can jump. That looks a lot better. Okay. That sorts Pinky's game logic. Now let's make something that she can catch. <coughs> so, I mean, given the sound effect, how about she catches coins? Does that seem reasonable? So let's make a coin stream. Oh, let's make an initial coin value first, just to keep it tidy. It's going to have the ID coin. It's going to have a, an X velocity of negative six and no Y velocity, which means it's going to come scrolling across the screen to, to the left. It's going to start way off screen at 1600 pixels and it's going to be positioned just below the top of it. So the idea is that this coin is going to start off screen and it's gonna scroll slowly towards the screen, eventually appearing, and then Pinky has to jump to catch it. Oh, this one's on, isn't it? Um, so let's make the coin stream. Now, actually, because this one needs to know 
where pink is because when she touches it, it will have to change state. It's, it gets caught. So I'm going to have to actually scan pinky stream to do this. So same as previously for pinky, except we start with the initial coin value and a function which takes the, the previous coin and pinky, pinky's current node, because that's what we're scanning over. And we apply velocity. And so first of all, let's just get it on screen. And we also have to make sure that it restarts when it goes off the screen to the left. So I'm using my on screen function from up here, which essentially just checks if the X coordinate is a bit off screen. And if C is off screen, then, oh sorry, if it's on screen, then we just keep returning C. Otherwise, we reset it to initial coin. So it's going to essentially loop back to its original position when it goes off screen. So, Let's see if it shows up. Oh, of course not. What did I forget? I have to add the stream to the zip. Now let's see if there's a coin. Now there should be. There it is. It's a Doge coin. I can't catch it though. I need to fix that. That's fairly simple because I've written another function. Uh, first of all, if it's not moving upwards, this is going to be how I determine what state it's in, because essentially, in its initial state, it's moving leftwards. And when Pinky touches it, I want it to stop moving leftwards, and I want it to stop moving slowly upwards, like when, when Super Mario catches the coin. And then go off screen, and then restart, and play a sound. So if the, the y velocity is zero, that means it's still not being caught. And I also made a function called intersect, which I haven't shown you. It's just magically in there. It's not very fancy, but it's just a lot of numbers. It's really boring. And what it does, it, it allows me to test whether two, two nodes are sort of touching each other. These nodes then actually have bounds because they're not allowed to read the DOM. So I'm using an approximation, but it works out. So essentially, if she touches the coin and the coin is still not yet caught, then make it caught. First of all, we play some sound. Hopefully you recognize this one too. And we set her, her X velocity to zero and her y velocity to negative one, which makes it move very slowly upwards. And if it is caught, then each frame we want to make its velocity a bit faster. Multiply by two each, each tick, which means that it's going to start moving very slowly and then it's going to start moving faster and faster until it's gone. So let's see if that works. She can still jump. Where's the coin? Where's the coin? There it is. Oh, I caught it. And it plays a, a nice sound and it moves off screen. And let's try that one more time. Cool. Okay. Wow, well, I've got 20 minutes left and I'm nearly done with the game. Which means it gets a longer break. Okay, so one more thing I want to do which is essentially just like the coin, except the exact opposite. I want uh, an obstacle that she has to jump over, otherwise she goes into the end game state. Essentially game over. And I'm gonna put that on top, because in this case I need to pipe this one into Pinky, because Pinky has to know just when she touches it. And it doesn't care whether uh, Pinky has hit it, it just keeps going, because it's just, a, it's just an obstacle. Actually, just an obstacle, um, I think most people who follow My Little Pony on the internet know that there is a problem with haters. And haters don't like people who like ponies. 
They're going to have a hater, which Pinky has to avoid, or she'll get very sad and, and go to game over. Uh, I'm going to need to scan the hater of a tick. Going to need um, an initial hater, just like previously. And the ID is going to be hater. Its velocity is going to be negative eight, so it moves slightly faster than the coin. Same principle though. Size of screen, why 300 that puts it on the ground essentially. Scan of the initial hater. Don't see in keys, we don't care about keys here. But the C, uh, the H, it should be. H for hater. Same here, h is velocity of h, and we just return h. Oh, sorry, same thing, on screen, h, then h as initial hater. There we go, put the stream in the, the render thingy. So that should get the hater, but now of course Pinky doesn't uh, end game when she hits it. That's the hater. Just passing by. Now we have to make Pinky actually um, react to the hater. So I'm going to introduce one more value to Pinky. The game over flag, which is going to be false, and then obviously uh, when she hits the hater, that turns to true. And I'm going to need to change how I scan over Pinky a bit. because uh, now I need not just to track uh, key presses with tick, but I also need to know where the hater is. So I put the hater stream in there too. And I scan over that, which means that now I'm not getting just keys here. I'm getting keys and hater. And I'm doing some ESX destructuring here. Um, what I get as the second argument is a list and the first element is keys, and the second element is hater, so I just destructure that into the, the variables keys and hater. Very convenient. So that should make us unchanged, except now I can track the hater. So that goes first. If P touches hater, and P is not in game over, then P game over is true. P ID is changed a bit because I want her in the game over state, so I change her animation. She's just she just keeps running normally. That's just an animated GIF. And when she goes into game over, I want her to change expressions. Stop running, look very sad. And then, just as in Super Mario, I wanted to sort of jump up a bit slower than usual, and then fall down actually through the ground this time. Which is why I'm putting this in front of the, uh, the normal laws of, of physics. So I can override them just a bit. But first, I wanna play the end game sound. And then I want her velocity to be negative 15. So a slightly less forceful jump. And if I'm in game over, every tick, I apply a slightly lower gravity of 0.5. And then I actually exit. I skip the rest if she's in game over. So bypassing the laws of physics, essentially. So let's see. It's hard not to, not to jump. Across the hater. I might I'm gonna need to jump because I don't like it. Okay, but let's see if it actually goes into game over. And that's what it's supposed to do. So that was the game. One more time. That's the hater. And of course I can keep playing this forever. Remarkably addictive for such a stupid little game. But that was the game. That was, you know, how many lines this is, not a lot. 
and it's actually completely pure functional programming. Uh, the um, the non-pure bits are handled by Rx and React for us. Right at the end is the only the only place where I'm actually causing side effects. That and the input event from bind key. So all of this is just functions which are entirely predictable. They take an input value and they output an output value, and the output value is always the same given the input value, which is about as, as functional as programming can get. This isn't entirely true. There's the matter of playing the audio, which is actually a side effect. You can get around that, just it's boring. So I've cheated just a bit there. But mostly, what I've shown you is um, some basic functional programming principles that actually make sense and turn out to be very useful in JavaScript, uh, at least game development. You can sort of apply this to, to UI programming as well, and you can certainly uh, apply it to backend development. It's, these streams are really cool for doing I.O. And, and database queries, and especially tracking uh, message, message buses, for instance. So that was it. That was the game in JavaScript in about 40 minutes. Concluding, yeah, here's my cheat page just in case I actually messed up completely. This is just the game. Well, this is just the game. There we go. Oh, it's hard not to play. <laughs> okay, so what you've seen is RxJS. And that's the URL for that if you want to take a look. I also want to mention some alternatives to RxJS. There's this other thing called Bacon, which um, it's a different take on essentially doing the same thing. Uh, the advantage of Bacon, practically, is that it's a lot smaller than Rx. The advantage of Rx is that it's more complete. It, it allows you to do a lot more just uh, out of the box. Which one is better? Depends on the situation, depends on your, your personal tastes. You should check out both, they're very cool. Finally, I'd like to tell you about this other thing called Elm, which is not just um, a reactive library, it's actually a language. It's sort of like, imagine if you got Haskell, except it was designed by, by the usability experts at Apple or something like that. It's sort of Haskell without the scary bits. It's, it compiles to JavaScript. It's built completely ar around the principles that, that you just saw of, of purity, immutable data structures, and reactive programming. And it's really, really cool. And it puts the, the fun back in doing uh, type functional programming. And it compiles very nicely and cleanly to JavaScript and sort of masks out the if bits of, of the DOM and whatnot that I was using React to not have to deal with right now. So if you want to try something slightly unusual and very, very cool. You should check out Elm. And that was it for me. Thank you ever so much. I should mention um, my slides are actually just a web page. And if you go to this, this URL, readynuttles.boogaloo, you actually get the whole editor that I was using. You can play the game. You can write the game if you want and just generally play around with that. Okay, so do we do questions? All right, any questions? There's a question slide. I think it is way too early for questions though. I think we are in agreement. Cool, then I guess we'll take a break or do you want to do the introductory talk straight away? All right, I'll yield the stage to you.